If your dog's doing this, you'll need answers to three important questions. What's the cause? What are the short-term implications? And should I be worried about long-term consequences? Now on average, we cope better with the concept of short-term pain, otherwise known as acute pain, because knowing it's temporary makes acute pain easier to endure. But what if your dog's been limping for weeks or months? Now this implies chronic pain and it's a completely different prospect. Under these circumstances, everyone dreads the words, your dog has elbow dysplasia. Because when you hear these words, you know you're fighting a condition without a cure. We have good treatments, but we'd all much prefer a chronic muscle injury, something we can treat knowing it'll eventually heal. So what's the likelihood that the average dog with chronic forelimb lameness is suffering from elbow dysplasia? Well, the key words here are suffering from, because an abnormal elbow x-ray doesn't necessarily translate to chronic elbow pain. If you're a subscriber, you'll learn more about this relationship in another guide. But for now, we'll talk about clinical risk. Now, some of our most valuable insight comes from large scale guide dog studies. And there are many reasons why they're so helpful. For a start, they include popular breeds like retrievers and shepherds. And of course, breeding guide dogs are carefully screened to limit risk. They limit the likelihood of any debilitating condition including elbow dysplasia. In this 11 year study of Australian guide dogs, one in five developed lameness caused by elbow dysplasia. So it was very common despite the charity's cautious approach. Now, although they collected their data in the 1980s, it remains relevant because a more recent study published in 2016 found that one third of British guide dogs were retired because of musculoskeletal problems including elbow dysplasia. Now, other useful resources teach us which breeds have a higher risk than average. For instance, the Royal Veterinary College published this study, including data from nearly half a million pet dogs. Now, they teach us that Labradors and Rottweilers have a six times higher risk of elbow dysplasia compared with mixed breed controls. Now, although this statistic seems remarkable, it doesn't steal the headline. The number which truly grabs our attention is the tragic reality that chronic pain was cited as a reason to ultimately euthanize four out of 10 affected dogs. And it's because of this statistic that specialists like me take elbow dysplasia so seriously. Now, if you want to learn about a specific breed's risk profile, you'll find links in the comments section. But of course, not all dogs are purebred. So what about mixed breed risk? One of the best sources of information about mixed breeds comes from a team at the University of Florida. And they published several studies demonstrating what happens when abnormal Labradors are crossed with normal Greyhounds. In this example, the test condition was hip dysplasia, but the principle applies to any dysplasia. And that principle is that the higher the percentage of the genetically privileged breed, in this case a Greyhound, the lower the risk of joint disease. In effect, we're diluting the harmful genes. And the more we dilute them, the lower the risk. So if we cross similar breeds with a similar risk profile, say an American Bulldog and a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, who both have an elbow dysplasia risk of around one in five, we'll expect their puppies to also have a risk of around one in five. So in summary, Elbow dysplasia is complex, it's common, and it can cause suffering and loss of life. Every dog owner should be aware of elbow dysplasia. So if you learned something new today, please give us a like, or even better, share this guide with a friend.